Lord, help those that hear this message understand what it is that we're getting at here today. And when I say we, it's actually your message. But help me, help me to convey it, that they may understand that this is not a fault-finding message, but it's to help them to grow and rightly divide that which is spirit and that which is flesh, and that they may grow thereby and move in a greater place of surrender to you. That's, that's the prayer for this message, Father. And that's what I ask in Jesus' name, and that nobody take offense to it, and that um, nobody be offended by it, but it would help them to grow. And that I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The message for this morning that uh, the Lord laid on my heart is, that which is spirit is spirit, that which is flesh is flesh. And we're going to start off reading in John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The Pharisees had it all together, they, at least they thought they did. According to the letter of the law, we know that they were the religious elite. They had it dialed in, if you want to use that phrase. They knew what they were doing. They knew the letter of the law. They were, well, Paul himself said, I was chiefest of among them. I was the Pharisees of the Pharisees. Touching the law, you couldn't touch it or find any fault at all in Paul because he had it all together according to the letter of the law. But we know his truth. We know the story on him. So anyway, there was a fair name, man named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, and if you notice, he went by night because he didn't want the other religious leaders seeing that he was actually going to Jesus. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except that God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it will, and you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. And so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto, them, unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you not a master of Israel, and you don't know these things? Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you have not received our witness. For if I told you of earthly things, and you didn't believe me, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. I'm going to take a pause right there. That verse, that one verse, when you sit down and actually break it up and think about what Jesus had just said, that's a message in, in a complete different message of itself. No man has gone up to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. What he's saying in that verse is, well, I came from there, I'm going back there, but while I'm here, I'm still over there. That's a hard one to wrap your head around. It's because he's talking about the spiritual places. He's talking about the spiritual places. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, and it goes on from there, um, why he came and everything else. If you look closely at those scriptures, you know, Nicodemus was talking, to, he was so engulfed in the religious realm, into the physical realm of the do's and the don'ts, and what it is that he, you should do, shouldn't do, and that kind of stuff. But that's what religion will do for you. That's where religion takes you. It takes you into the laws. It takes you into the do's, the don'ts. Wherein Jesus cut to the chase and said that you must be born again of the Spirit. That which is spirit is spirit. That which is flesh is flesh. The spiritual things of God cannot be understood fully by your flesh. You can't do it. They are discerned 
spiritual things are discerned by the Spirit. It's a deeper place in Christ. It's a deeper place in God. It's a, uh, a place of absolute surrender and submission to the living one. A place in the Spirit, not in the flesh. I want to look over here at uh, John chapter 4. And uh, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though he himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and parted, departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria, and he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sachar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, he sat on the well. It was about the sixth hour of the day, about high noon. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone into the city to buy meat. And you have to understand something. In the, uh, back in the day, the Samaritans were considered as dogs. They had, a relig they had a Jewish background, but they were intermingled with Gentiles. And, and so the, the true Jews considered them but dogs and didn't want any parts of them. They were filthy. They were considered uh, filthy. And so a lot of the high elite Jews wanted nothing to do with these people. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, you ask drink of me, which, is a, a, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And I just explained that. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that said unto you, Give me to drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. He's talking about that spiritual place, that spiritual living water, uh, the Holy Ghost. The woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then has this living water? Are you greater than our father, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him in him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And it goes on from there. But he's talking about the spiritual aspect of things. The Bible reads that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. It is a spiritual place. Flesh is flesh, spirit is spirit. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. I've seen a lot of times when people try to be spiritual while they are actually moving in the flesh. They've been around spiritual things and they try to replicate what it is that they're seeing. I'm not condemning them. Um, I'll, I'll just give it to you this way. You know, uh, I don't know if it was Wigglesworth or Hagen. I'm taking my notes out of order, so I might repeat it. Wigglesworth or Hagen said many times they started out in the flesh and ended up in the spirit. Um, and I think it was Hagen. I think, you know, the first time he ever danced in the spirit, he said he saw people dancing and he didn't receive it. He wouldn't receive it. And he's like, well, that, that's not happening to me, and, or whatever he said. And um, so then he started, it, one day he said, why not? So he cut loose and he gave it a whirl. He started out in the flesh, and by that time he started out in the flesh, the Holy Ghost took over and away he went. There's so many times that I've moved in the flesh and I shouldn't have. Uh, thinking I was super spiritual, I'll give you a good example. One time there was a lady who was in the hospital, a friend of mine, he was a minister. His mother had suffered a stroke. And um, this is uh, oh, this is going way back after I first got filled with the Holy Ghost. I think I thought I knew it all. Trying to be super spiritual. Uh, she went to the hospital and she was laying in there recovering. She was doing a great job at recovery. She uh, commented that uh, God's willing to help them and help themselves. She goes, it's in there. Well, me being super spiritual or so I thought was moving in my flesh and I had to bust her bubble and say well that's not in the Bible and she's like it's not and I said no that's not in there at all 
and as a result the woman the woman quit trying and did not go any further in her recovery in fact got worse just because you know something doesn't make you spiritual just because you know of a truth doesn't mean that you have to bust the bubble of the person with whom it has to do. Unless the Spirit of God leads you to bring correction to somebody like that, you leave it alone. You leave them alone. You don't have to correct everything that you see. Everybody has a place to grow up in. Being born again of the Spirit is an experience. It's a walk of life. It's an entire changing of everything. I'm still learning to walk by the Spirit. I'm still walking in the flesh at times. There's times I still do things in the flesh. And yet, we have to be careful that we don't crush the heart of the person who's at least trying. And we can crush them by us being in the flesh thinking that we're spiritual or that we're more spiritual than they are. I knew of a minister one time who thought that they were the most spiritual thing that came upon the face of the earth. And as a result, great devastation was done by that individual. That minister would condemn other ministers would speak down on them, and there was a time when they were in the same uh, congregation, the one minister, he got up to speak. Well, the other one that thought they were super spiritual got right up and walked right out. That's not super spiritual, folks. That's being super religious. Being heavy, haughty, excuse me, being haughty and high-minded, thinking you're all that in a bag of chips. Well, I'm here to tell you you're not. There is a time and a place for, for correction. There is a time and a place to learn. There is a time and a place to move in the calling of the Spirit. But it's never to grind on somebody else. It's never to exalt yourself above them. So you have to be really careful with what you're doing. Because if you're truly spiritual, the Lord said that it, they that are spiritual, when, and well, Paul wrote about it, that if a brother is taken in a fault, you who are spiritual, go and restore such a one. It's easy to talk about. A couple key notes about walking in the Spirit. It's a place of absolute surrender of yourself. It's a place of humility, desiring absolutely nothing but the perfect will of God, the perfect words of God, the perfect moving of His Spirit through you, that He could convey, that He could bring correction, that He could bring restoration, that He can work through you and accomplish that which needs to be done. Moving in the Spirit is not you seeing something and then automatically judging it. That's moving in your flesh. If God reveals something to you, that doesn't mean that you have to go and tell everybody everything that He just showed you either. There's a difference between the Spirit and being in the flesh. Can I be moving in the Spirit and do something in the flesh? Yes, I've done that. We have to be careful. You know, we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit who's working in us. I've seen people who want to portray themselves as being spiritual by the way they speak in tongues. They can do all things, living in the flesh all day long, but then when they want to perceive as though they're spiritual, they will blurt out a few things in tongues to try to impress somebody. But I'm not impressed. You're moving in the flesh. You're just trying to portray that you're deeper than what you really are. I saw a man one time wanting to be spiritual, 
even in public, in the public arena, he was walking around speaking in tongues all the time. And it, the nature of his tongues, and I'm not judging his tongues, but it just sounded like he was repeating da 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 in a public arena around many other people who had no clue what was going on. And when he did that, it was not appropriate. It looked like he was just some madman that madman that was stuttering. Was he in tongues? That's between him and God. Who is it that speaks the utterance and gives the utterance but God himself, the Holy Ghost? Now I'll talk about my own personal self. I go through, I have several different buildings I'm over, and there's times that I'm walking through these buildings, nobody is around. I am praying in tongues because nobody's around. I don't expect to see people in some of these buildings, and, uh, and so I can do that because nobody's around. I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm not trying to show off, but I'm truly, truly just praying in the Holy Ghost because it says to build up your most holy faith, praying always in the Holy Ghost. So there is a time and a place for everything. But as I'm going down through the building, I had a group of employees that were in there. They were to be, oh, I'd say a good 50 yards down the other end of the building into some back office. But as I'm coming down through there and I walk around, and I'm praying in tongues out loud, I walk around the flash curtain, the welding curtain, and I came face to face with the whole group of them. <laughs> I'm like, oh, hey, there you are. I didn't try to explain myself. They didn't ask me any questions about it. It was never being done for a show. It was between me and God. I was never expecting anybody to be there. But it happened. Moving in the spirit versus moving in the flesh. Many times when I'd go to pray for somebody out in the wild, like at the garage or wherever I encounter them, the flesh would scream, let them alone. Or it was the enemy telling me not to because he didn't want me to get involved in something. Leave him alone, leave him alone, leave him alone. And I'd hear that and I'd think that and I'd feel that. But by the Holy Ghost, I knew that I needed to pray for them. And I went and ministered unto them and they received a miracle. The spiritual things are spiritually discerned. It's a deeper place of surrender to God. It's a deeper place. It's a commitment to Him, a surrender to Him, day and night, walking in the Spirit. It says you walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We have to face the reality. We are spiritual beings trapped in a physical body. It's a, and there's a time of, dis, you, it, it's a time of discernment. You have to discern what's going on around you. It's so easy to live in this body. But we have to walk in a place of absolute humility, of surrender to God. That's the only way you're going to hear from the Spirit. It's the only way you're going to know what is truly spiritual. And pray for discernment. We all have to grow up. It's not always easy. If you look back here at 1 Corinthians 14, flip back here real quick, whatever fast is. And there's so many other aspects other than just speaking in tongues, but tongues is one of the most obvious ones. Follow after charity and desire of spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God, for no man understands him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he that prophesies speaks unto men unto edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. I would that you all spoke in tongues, 
but rather that you would prophesy. For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except that he interpret that the church may receive the edifying. There are so many aspects of tongues. I don't want to get too far off into tongues, but it's one of the most obvious gifts. But there are so many other things that happen when you're walking in the Spirit, when you surrender to the Spirit. I want to re reiterate, the spiritual place, it's a deeper place of surrender of your mind, your will, your emotions at a deep level. It's never about you. It's always about what does the Lord want? What are you saying, Lord? What do you want? What do you want to accomplish today? What do you want to say through me? What do you want to do through me? It's a place of surrender to Him. And I've said that over again and over again and over again, and I'll say it again before I'm done with this message today. It's a place of absolute abandonment of yourself, of what you want to follow His will. It's a place of commitment. Allowing every thought, every intent, every desire of your own to be laid aside and to be fully yielded to Jesus. This past week, I went through some wars. I'm not giving glory to the devil by saying that. I'm just speaking realities. My mind, my thoughts, my emotions, physically, spiritually, everything was set against me. Everything. It's just incredible. But what kept me? What kept me from going and losing my mind? It was the Word of God. An absolute surrender to Him. I looked at Him and I said, Father, You are the living one. You, Lord Jesus, You have overcome all principalities and all powers. You are the victor. You are the one that heals. You are the one that gave us the authority over every power, of the every thing about the enemy. You gave us that power and authority over Him. Lord, you're the one. It was a place of surrender and abandonment to him, regardless of just how bad my mind, my emotions, my physical, and everything else came against me. It didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was that place in him of yielding and surrendering to him. There's times I move in the spirit. There's times I move in the flesh. I had to talk to an atheist one time down on the floor about a work-related situation. And I was praying to God. It's like, you know, God, everything about that man is negative, and I don't want to even talk to him. I didn't want to. I didn't, just didn't want to. I wanted to avoid him. Wanted to. But I'm saying, Father, I need your help. Give me the words. Lord, you give me the words. And as I approached the man, I spoke the business that I spoke. But on his shirt, he had a, a shirt that said, Thank God I'm atheist. By yielding myself to the Lord, I started laughing hysterically. I started laughing. He, he's like, what's funny? I said, it's your shirt, man. And I laughed. And out of my belly came the words. Out of my belly came the words. The words came because I was in a place of surrender to God. Surrendered of all of everything that I wanted. Surrendered of my own will. Surrendered of my own words. Surrendered of myself to Him. For Him to be able to speak through me. It's a place of surrender of everything of yourself. And allowing the Holy Ghost to rise up in you and move through you. It's a surrender of everything of yourself. He asked, what, would I was, what was I laughing at? And I said, it's your shirt, man. I said, it, it, out of my belly came the words, it's the funniest thing I have ever seen. There it is. You're thanking the very God that you say don't exist. And furthermore, without even another thought, I just looked up to heaven, raised my hand, and I said, thank you, God. For you've given it to every man to know that you are. And I turned and walked away. Hallelujah. 
You have to walk in a place of abandonment of your own desires, your own will, your own want, your own hopes, your own thinking, your own reasoning, your own rationale, your everything. Everything. Complete surrender to Christ and allowing the Holy Ghost to have His way in you. I've seen many people moving and doing things in the flesh and they were thinking that they were being spiritual. Whether it was a religious deed or there's some other things I'm just not going to go into detail. But I never went, I never said a word to them. You leave them alone. When the time is right, and if they need to be brought into correction, the Lord will, the Lord will lead you. You don't need to go around those that are, think they're spiritual. You don't need to go around trying to correct everything. You don't have to. If you do that, you're just going to bring destruction. That which is spirit is spirit. That which is flesh is flesh. If somebody's truly spiritual, you'll see it in what they do, how they walk, how they talk. Are they walking in love? When they came to when uh, the rich young ruler came to Christ, he said, "What's the greatest commandment?" And I'm sorry, I got the stories mixed up. One of the fellows said to Jesus, "What's the greatest commandment?" He said, "To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, soul, and body." And he said, "What?" And the second is like unto that: love your neighbor as yourself, because on all these two hinge all of the law and the prophets. Because if you're walking in love, you're not going to commit adultery against your wife if you truly loved her. If you love God, you're not going to go around worshiping other idols. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to go over there and steal his stuff. Or if somebody gets something of, that's really nice, you're not going to sit there and covet the thing. You're just going to be, you're, if you're truly walking in love. Check yourself. I saw a minister who thought she was truly spiritual. I'm pretty sure she's dead and gone by now, so I'm going to go ahead and speak on it. The woman acted as if, as if she hated men. But yet she considered herself more spiritual than anybody else. She was moving in the flesh. It wasn't God. I've done stupid things thinking that I was moving by the Spirit, but I wasn't. I was moving according to my own divine imagination. It's easy to do that. I'm only telling you that because I've been there. I've done that. It takes true humility, true surrender. I used to think stupid things all the time. I used to think that if I fasted more often, then that would make me more spiritual. And I would fast two and three times a week, eating nothing for a span of a day. But that wasn't spiritual. Then there was times that, uh, and I'll go ahead and say it, there was a time that I fasted and went without food or water for almost a week. It's extremely dangerous and extremely stupid. You can die from that. Yet in ignorance, I thought I was being spiritual, but it wasn't. It was stupid. Because I had it in my head, the flesh must die, the flesh must die. That wasn't God. And as I knelt down before the bed to pray before I went to bed that, that day, on the last day of it all, I said to the Father, I said, Father, I don't have the strength to barely even get into bed. I'm certain that I won't be able to get up, but thank you. And I crawled into bed, and there was an angel of God that was sent to me with a pitcher. And I drank from that pitcher, and as I swallowed, I found myself swallowing also in the flesh, and I woke right up, and I had the strength of a new man. 
God was faithful, had he not intervened in my stupidity, I most certainly would have died. Trying to be spiritual. I didn't do it to have an encounter with God in that sense. I wasn't seeking an angelic visitation from God with a pitcher of water or whatever it was it gave me to drink. But it happened that way. It's a cautionary tale. We want to be spiritual. We want to be like Jesus. We want to do this and we want to act like that. You want to really be spiritual? Then obey God. Obey God. If the Holy Ghost is leading you to do something and you want to be spiritual, then walk in a place of surrender to Him and obey what He is saying. Don't come off with some weird stuff out of your own mind and think God's telling you this. He is. A lot of stuff isn't. A lot of stuff comes from your own divine imagination. This thing wherein in the last days the Lord said He would send great illusion on them and they would follow after their own imaginations, He is not putting the delusion on you. The problem is you are not in that place of absolute surrender of your own will to allow God to have His way in you according to the Word. And you're moving either in rebellion or you're doing your own little sinful thing and you're not letting go of things and you're not moving in a place of surrender to Him. Therefore, you're chasing after your own divine imaginations, thinking it's God, and God is not in it. It's a place of absolute surrender to Him of your own mind, will, emotions, thoughts, and everything else. Allowing the Holy Ghost to have His way through you, in you, for God's glory. Walking in a spirit of love. There is times of a righteous anger. I've seen it. There is times, even through that uh, one incident, there was a lady who got both doses of the vaccine because she was afraid of losing her job. She said she believed in the Holy Ghost. She said she believed, uh, well, obviously, believed in Christ, believed in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Yet, out of fear of losing her job, she went and got both doses of the vaccine. And her arm was sore from here to here. And as I spoke with this woman, there was an anger that rose up in my heart. It was a holy anger. Now people try to say, why? Well, you know, I'm not going to try to sort through what it is that the Holy Ghost was doing. I just know that the Spirit of God was grieved. Was it because of everybody's unbelief? Was it because they subjected them to themselves to the things of man so that they wouldn't lose their job. I don't know. I'm not going to sort it out. But that holy anger rose up in my heart. And I went home that day mad. And I said to the Lord, I said, you know, I never offered to pray for that woman. And I said to the Lord, I said, if I don't have compassion for her or for somebody, then what good is any of this? I purposed in my heart the next day that I would at least go and pray for her. But as I approached that woman, that same anger rose up again in my heart. It was a holy anger. I approached that woman and I got huffy and I said, so is your arm still sore? She said, yeah. I pointed at her arm then I said, in the name of Jesus, I command the soreness to come out. And immediately it did and immediately the anger left. There is a time of a holy anger that will come upon you. Jesus was very provoked with the religious elite. When he went into that temple, he had made a scourge. He thought it through before he made the scourge. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He wove that scourge. He went in there and started whipping people, beating things, throwing tables, and kicking pigs. Chased everything out of the temple. I'm sure there wasn't a pig in the temple, but it, it was just whatever. It came out that way. Birds and 
lambs and sheep and bleeding of sheep and everything under the sun. He kicked everything out and the money changers out. And he said, this, my house should be a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. Tell me how he wasn't moving by the Spirit. He was. Sometimes the Holy Ghost will come upon you and sometimes you will have to bring correction. And sometimes He will be angry. The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. That which is spirit is spirit. That which is flesh is flesh. I would not have dared to do a lot of things if it weren't for the Holy Ghost. Sometimes that's just the way it is. Who can discern? Who can know what the Spirit is saying? Who can know what the Spirit is doing? I've said it before, it's a place of absolute surrender and an abandonment of your own self, your own thoughts, your own desires, your own will. A complete surrender of everything of yourself and allowing the Holy Ghost to manifest and move through you. I shared with a sister last night. I said, oh, of a number of screw-ups that I've had. I said, I make it sound like everything's always, you know, uh, great accomplishments and great successes. For God it is. But for me, I've screwed things up and have made complete utter wrecks out of what God wanted to do. What do you do when you do that? You, you say, Father, will you forgive me? You move over into a deeper place and surrender to Him for Him to have His way in you. That's what you do. Are you going to screw things up? You betcha. Paul wrote about it. The things that I should do, I don't. The very things that I should not do are the very things that I do. A wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from the bondage of this flesh? Oh, but I thank God for our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you going to screw things up while you try to move in the Spirit? Yes. What do you do? Father, will you forgive me? Lord, I'm so sorry I grieved you. I give it to you, Lord. I surrender myself to you. I've seen many people doing, th moving and doing things in the flesh thinking that they were being spiritual and never said a word to them. You only want to bring correction as the Holy Ghost leads you. You don't have to correct everything you see. You really don't. Don't try it. That doesn't make you spiritual. That makes you obnoxious and nobody wants to be around you. But if you minister in love, or minister as the Holy Ghost moves through you, then it will bring change. I've had to bring messages to people that were uncomfortable things that I would not have liked to have said, but had to bring, had, and had to said. I had to tell people, look, you know, you're living in sin, and you need to repent. Because the Holy Ghost was saying to say that to them, and I did. And as a result, they repented. Tough messages. Sometimes, it, not everything's going to be an easy-peasy message. It, it isn't. But there's a place of discernment, a place of surrender, a place of living in the spiritual realm, a place of living in surrender to Christ. Completely, everything, all day, every day. I heard it said one time, if there's enough wet blankets, if you do, people moving in the flesh, there's enough wet blankets to put out any wildfire. <laughs> Let them alone. Somebody's dancing and you don't think it's of God, you don't think it's in the Spirit, who are you to judge? Let them alone. They're doing something for God. They're praising Him in dance. They're praising Him in whatever song they're singing. That's between them and the Lord. They're bringing glory to Him in their own way. They're worshiping and exalting Him. Leave them alone. People uses using catchphrases to try to sound spiritual. Don't do that. They can't do that. They're, you're a child of the king. 
If you're going through some kind of spiritual warfare, hey, come on out. I'll pray for you. I've, I've, prayed, for many, I've prayed for people who are going through a lot of spiritual warfare. I'll pray for you. I'll help you. I'll, I'll direct you to Christ. He is the deliverer. Amen. That's the truth. That's a revelation. But I've seen people use the catchphrases, you know, they can't do that. You're a child of the king. That's not spiritual. That doesn't help anybody. There's no revelation in that. When you get a revelation by the Spirit of the Word of God, and the Spirit of God or the Word of God is alive in your heart, it is made real to you as a revelation of reality that is Rhema. John 15 spoke on that. Jesus said, Except you abide in me and my words abide in you. He's saying, Except you abide in me and this spiritual revelation, if you don't got that spiritual revelation in your heart of the reality, then forget it. You can do nothing. If you don't have that spiritual revelation by the Holy Ghost made alive in your heart, then it's just going to be a bunch of dead words to you. There was a man, Sceva, his seven sons. The seven sons and the religious leaders at that time, there was a possessed band. They went in there. And this is in the book of Acts. The seven sons said, went up to this man and they said, you know, we adjure you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out of him. And the man that was possessed looked at him and said, looked at them seven boys and their leaders and said, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? And that possessed man with all them devils broke bad beat every one of them, bleeding, wounded, tore their clothes off of them. They fled that place naked and bleeding, wounded. They were moving in the flesh. They were not born again of the Spirit. They were moving in the flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. That which is flesh is flesh. I've moved in the spirit and I've moved in the flesh. Be careful what you're doing. Before you go trying to bring correction to somebody, make sure that you are truly in a place of absolute and utter surrender to Christ. Of all your heart, all your mind, all your will, all your emotions, all your everything about you, your own desires, lay them aside. It's a place of absolute surrender to Christ. Then and only then will you know that you're truly walking in the Spirit. You have to be careful. The Bible tells us at the end of time how there will be great deceptions upon the face of the earth and that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Every man taking heed, therefore, while you stand, lest you fall. Be careful. If you're truly moving in the Spirit, you're going to move in the realm of restoration. You're going to move in the love of Christ. Think twice before you do something. An absolute surrender to God. And you may be uncomfortable doing something. You may be uncomfortable speaking what the Lord is asking you to speak. You want to measure your own spirituality? Measure it in accordance to your obedience to Christ in alignment with the Word. Well, Father, I thank you today. I thank you for the, the message of the Spirit of Spirit, flesh is flesh. Father, I pray for those that heard this message. I pray that you would minister to them and bring them all into a greater place of surrender to you, Father, letting go of everything of their own but absolute surrender to you. That they may move into a deeper place in the Spirit in you, and that you would meet them there, Lord Jesus. That I ask, that you would just seal that word in their heart for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.